We're hearing more and more about the role of clinicians, as well as engineers, in the development of new medical technologies. But what about patients? In this episode, we're going to be finding more about how you can involve patients in the development of new healthcare technologies, and as engineers, what you need to do to go about developing technologies that are intended to be used by the patients themselves. Hello, and welcome to The Evidence Space, a podcast produced by the Institution of Engineering and Technology that presents conversations with leaders from health, care, and life sciences. I'm your host, Dr. Peter Bannister, and in this episode, we'll be speaking to Dr. Ellen Hav-Davies, CEO of Aparito Healthcare, and Dr. Paul Wicks of Wicks Digital Health. Ellen, Paul, welcome to The Evidence Space. I might ask if you could both introduce yourselves and give us a fun fact about yourselves. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for inviting me to join you and Paul today. Um, So my background is in child health, um, and I worked clinically and then regulatory um, before setting up Aparito. Um, I guess the one fun fact about me is that I spent 77 days naked rowing across the Atlantic Ocean. Thanks very much, Ellen. And and Paul, would you mind doing the same by way of an introduction? Yes, Peter, thanks for the invitation. It's it's great to be here and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, My name is Paul Wicks. I'm a neuropsychologist by training, specialising in motor neuron disease and other neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, And I've spent about the last 20 years working in digital health, uh, in online communities, uh, wearable devices and digital therapeutics. Um, I'm very involved in publishing. And one fun fact is I believe I'm the first person to have ever got a poop emoji published in the British Medical Journal, although hopefully not the last. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Paul and Ellen. You're clearly both pioneers in your field in very distinct ways. Um, Paul, can I start with you by asking you to describe some of the ways that engineers and technologists can involve patients in the design process for new solutions in healthcare? Yes, so I've worked alongside mostly software engineers uh, in my career, and there seem to be two, two alternative approaches. One is a very product-driven one where you know, the engineers have got a brilliant idea of some sort of technology and they're looking for someone to come and play with it, try and break it and, and see what goes wrong. Uh, the other approach is when it's really come from the patients themselves to some degree, uh, where maybe it's become you know, a company founded by a family affected by a particular disease uh, or where patients are involved right from the beginning. Um, and so the engineers have been best able to understand every aspect of their lives as they develop, develop the technology. I'm more of a fan of the latter uh, approach because I've seen plenty of times when people come up with some brilliant whiz-bang idea, you know, let's stick an RFID chip in a toilet and see if we can use that as a, you know, IBS, Crohn's disease tracking device. Uh, let, let's see what makes sense there. But not completely realizing that from the patient's point of view, maybe the problem with their condition is, you know, they don't go out to supermarkets or restaurants or airports or something like that because of their condition. And so, you know, the whole point is they want to get away from the home, so they want to be more mobile. And so I think not taking that perspective of, of a real person um, can lead to a, a bit of tunnel vision. So, yeah, I, I'd really encourage people to think about the role that um, techniques such as ethnography can play, um, but also different levels of, of bringing patients in uh, as partners and, and really co-creators of, of technology and, and products and services to go around that. So, so as you're saying, understanding the real user requirements of the patient is fundamental. Ellen, you mentioned, of course, that you have, amongst other things, a clinical background. Are there ways in which you've observed the patient being effectively involved in designing new technology in a clinical setting? Yeah, so from our side at Aparito, we we really feel strongly that we need to get early patient input in not not just sort of what we measure, but how we measure it. And uh, majority of our deployments have involved some focus group or some early engagement with patient advocacy groups uh, or one-to-one user testing. Um, And what, you know, we feel quite strongly about is there is no such thing as one size fits all in this space. And even if you, you know, think of rare pediatric diseases, uh, what we found was that what worked in some children or for some children really did not work for other children. So an example would be, uh, you know, one of our um, neurometabolic disorders where the children had a lot of behavioral issues, uh, where we had picked a very bright, colorful, soft, wearable device. What happened was that the children liked it so much, they kept fighting through the strap, which we had not anticipated because we'd gone for a bright, soft color, one which we thought they'd like, not appreciating that they'd like it so much. Um, And then on the other side, you know, the same device, 
uh, in a different group of children that had some behavioral issue with autosensory issue, find the texture of the strap too much and it wasn't symmetrical on their wrist. So just would refuse to, to wear it because they didn't like the touch of it. Um, and there's the sensory issue. So, you know, that's a similar patient group in terms of age, but their response to it was so, so different. And that's where, you know, getting to learn these things early and sort of testing them early is, is just so essential. That's a great point. Um, Paul, coming back to you, you've had experience working with multiple large clinical studies. What particular value does patient collected data bring you that you don't get from data which may have been collected in a more conventional hospital setting by a healthcare professional? One of the things that's really been emerging over the past 30 years or so is just how many diseases we can't measure with reliable sort of physics based approaches. So things like blood pressure, blood glucose, you know, the size of a tumor. Um, not that those areas of medicine are easy by any means, but at least they're somewhat fungible. Nowadays, what a lot of people are struggling with is insomnia, pain, um, inability to sort of conduct their everyday lives, fatigue, um, you know, and, and different aspects where actually the treatment itself might be making people worse. So that's where we've been using more things like patient reported outcome measures or, or PRO measures. And they might not be um, as precise in, in the sense of, uh, you know, how many millimeters of tumor we have in MRI, but they're very important to that lived experience for the patient. Now, one of the challenges we find is that there's different um, levels of sensitivity and validation and all that kind of thing for these questionnaires as well. And what we find is there's, there's a balance uh, that if you struck between how burdensome it is for someone to complete this stuff. So if you take a typical researcher, they will want to ask you 50 questions. Um, unfortunately, if you're doing that on a mobile phone, that, that can take ages. So a lot of those 50 questions were written assuming that you'd be filling it out on a piece of paper in a waiting room at a hospital, waiting for your blood test, waiting for your x-ray, waiting for your doctor. When you put that into a smartphone, and now you're asking someone to do that every day, um, it becomes very tiresome, very boring, and so people's attention will drift. And they might just want to go, click, 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 how do I get through this as soon as possible? Many of your users, if they've been using things like the Zoe COVID symptom tracker, might have um, you know, had that experience. There's about 3 million people using it in the UK, um, where you know, the first time you fill it out, yes, I would cough, and no, I lost a sense of smell, that type of thing. But as they added more and more and more questions, and you've now done it 100 times, you might be getting a little bit bored. So there are these sort of cognitive and, and sort of motivational aspects that you have to, to bear in mind. So, um, you know, the, the flip side of that is if you make it too usable and friendly, almost like Ellen was saying with a colorful thing, if you make it too much like, well, here's a slider with brownie face here and happy face here, put, put where you're feeling. That might feel quite usable, quite intuitive. Statistically, that's useless. Um, because what does frowny face mean? What does happy face mean? And, and again, it depends who you're trying to convince. Um, in a clinical trial, you're trying to convince a number of different stakeholders. It could be regulators who can be quite slow to adapt to these types of technologies and be quite conservative. Um, once you've actually gotten approval, it could be someone who's deciding whether or not to pay for this product or technology that you've developed. And there are many cases where people have done a statistically significant improvement on some measure, but then the payer has said, am I going to pay you X thousand dollars because you moved a centimeter on a zero to 10 scale? Probably not. You've got the clinicians in many cases who have to make the decision whether or not they're going to prescribe this or, or adopt it in use. And they want to understand, well, is this moving something that's meaningful for me? And then, of course, the patients. You know, it would be useful for them to see measures and metrics that they can relate to changing in real time. So increasingly, people are familiar with you know, steps from, from wearables and that type of thing. But if the, the measurement doesn't relate to something that's important to them, doesn't matter to them, you know, they're not going to be motivated to do all the things they're doing, like entering the data or making sure the battery is charged on devices, all that kind of stuff. So, yes, it, it's very much a, a balancing act and, um, and trade-offs that are very real. OK, so what I'm hearing is there are a lot of behavioral and psychological factors that influence how likely we're able to be to collect that data in the first place. Um, then we need to consider the requirements of both the patients as well as the clinician. and Furthermore, there might also be other groups who might want to use the data. So just because it's possible to collect a certain type of data, the question also needs to be asked, how useful is that data or could it even be misused? Ellen, can I come back to you? You talked about some examples of Aparito where you've discovered unintended consequences arising from some of the design decisions you've made. Assuming, of course, that engineers are able to address these, 
More generally, what are the risks that occur if you don't involve patients in the design process? What, what bad things can happen if you don't get their input early on when developing the requirements for your design? So I think there's two, two obvious one is, you know, the, the sort of immediate one is the cost implication and time implication that you've gone down a certain road for too long. And then, you know, you have to reverse quite some considerable distance to sort of undo all the design work and start again. Um, and, you know, from a, a, a small company like ours, all that sort of time resource aspect. But I think in the, you know, the bigger picture and the longer one is what we don't want is to start measuring the wrong things. And so we already have plenty of, of examples where we use primary endpoints in studies. We measure aspects in clinics and then clinicians will say, um, uh, or patients, I should say, will say, well, why are you measuring that? That's really not important for me. Um, and it has no relevance to, to what, we, what we find difficult in day-to-day -day life. So what we definitely don't want in terms of remote data or patient-generated data is measuring yet another thing that is not of value or not of meaning or not of importance to the patient and family. Well, that makes sense. Uh, I know both of you are very involved in patient advocacy groups. Can you recommend to engineers how they can access groups like these to help them avoid making those bad design decisions, both early but also later on at any other stage in the design process? From both, so, you know, both my hat, you know, I'm chair of Metabolic Support UK, and one of the leading roles that uh, Metabolic Support UK do in terms of building community is to be that conduit between um, patient opinions and patient uh you know wishes and getting them engaged in the design and then from an apparito point of view uh you know we've just launched a patient accelerator group which is to invite patient groups to sort of co-create with us in that sense paul from your perspective given the work you've done on als and more generally with organizations like patients like me what's your perspective on how someone from the technology world can engage early with patients with the people who hold the answers as to how to go about collecting this data? Yeah, so I think it really varies a lot by conditions. So, you know, if you're trying to find somebody who's got type 2 diabetes, you may know someone within your own family or, or extended network of friends. And you know, that, that's as good a point as any to you know, work with them and understand how, how something affects their life. Um, but, you know, there's a, a range of different approaches we've seen. So in some conditions, for example, they're highly networked um, blogger, influencer, activist people who you can basically find online. Um, and some of them have even created their own sort of mini agencies. So I mentioned um, inflammatory bowel disorders like Crohn's ulcerative colitis earlier. There's a patient advocate called Seb Tucknot who runs um, a community called um, ibdrelief.com. And they actually are trying to, to pair up the engineers and device manufacturers, things like that, with people with lived experience of a condition for exactly this purpose. Um, but uh, a patient like me, I worked with 3,000 conditions. Um, and it's quite difficult to sort of say in your head, well, you know, how do we find all these um, so I think patient organizations are, are certainly one way. Um, they're often not used to being approached for this, actually. A lot of traditional charities, um, you know, wouldn't really know what to tell you. So um, I would certainly use social media, see who's sort of out there, who's public about their condition, um, and who is, uh, you know, uh, willing to, to engage with you. Um, there are good guidelines now on, on this type of process. So in a medical clinical context, working with patients on the design of, say, your study, or even your medicine uh, is called PPI, not to be confused with PPE, but this is patient and public involvement. Um, and there are many guidelines out there uh, that, that can help give some guidance. A really key one um, comes from a group called Involve, and that gives you some suggestions. So if you're going to work with a patient, is it reasonable that they do this in their spare time? Um, is it reasonable that they incur expenses? And um, you know, obviously you're doing something great and you're making this wonderful device and, and things like that, but probably you're being paid to. Probably you have some financial upside if it's successful. Um, and yes, it should benefit patients in general and help humanity. But I think there is a, a general consensus reached over the past decade or so that if you're leveraging a patient's experience and expertise, it won't just be because they're a sick person, it'll be because they're giving you useful feedback, they're helping to improve your product. And so I, I do think it is reasonable to reimburse them for their time. That's not to say that you need to massively incentivize them with a, with a great big um, you know, reimbursement, but I think it's reasonable to cover people's costs and Involve gives great guidance in the UK on, on how to do this. To echo that, so there's an uh, IMI project called Paradigm that recently sort of worked quite heavily on this topic. 
and came up with some guidance on how to reimburse patient inputs at a sort of fair market value. So to sort of find that balance between you're not inducing them just to tell you what you want to hear or, or sort of become a brand ambassador for you, but actually reimbursing them in the way that you would do any other expert that you'd be seeking their advice or input on your product development. And, right. and I think that's really important uh, for transparency and also for sustainability of making sure that the patients can engage uh, in this way. So I think that's really important. And if I may just add one other thing, that the challenge you have is not always just relying on the very empowered, well-informed patient that is at the forefront of this sort of influencer blogger. What you really want is your, I mean, I'm not saying there's such a thing as an average patient, but the patient that's not necessarily going to be the one that, you know, highly engaged, highly enthusiastic in the time and effort and research. And they just want to get on with their day-to-day life and give you a very honest answer about what that can fit and on that aspect, really. Just for the benefit of our audience, can you explain what IMI is? So IMI is a pretty exciting uh, initiative called the Innovative Medicine Initiative. And it's a European uh, Commission partnership with uh, FPA, which is the European Forum of Pharmaceutical Medicine, I think. I just... uh, got that acronym but um so they sort of co-invest or co-fund various projects and i think they've invested in around 56 different projects now uh they've got one really exciting one called charles at home which is supporting uh moving towards decentralized or hybrid clinical trials paradigm was the one about patient centricity um adapt smart was a one about innovative study design so quite an exciting and different array of, of projects they funded in terms of some of the methods that you can use, um, so it may well be that if you're working in a disease area that where there are lots of pharmaceutical uh, companies involved, that a lot of this research may already have been done. So I think an, an important starting point is to do some desk research. And the types of things that you might be looking for is something like a burden of illness study. So a lot of um, pharmaceutical companies will commission academics or independent consultants to go out and do things like um, qualitative interviews, focus groups and surveys. Um, often done in partnership with the nonprofit groups. And so they will often have, you know, an array of symptoms uh, rank ordered by how bothersome they are, or an attempt to understand what the work and productivity economic burden is of having a condition. And there may be a lot there that you can you can initially work from, and they will have, have done a lot of that, um, that legwork to make sure that, that the research is representative. Um, if you're very lucky, they, they may have been something that the FDA has done in, in their group called Patient Focused Drug Development where they have actually commissioned large studies to come and bring this together. So when I worked with patients like me, for example, we made submissions uh, alongside the Michael J. Fox Foundation about what matters to people living with Parkinson's disease, and it's very interesting. A lot of engineers, because there's lots of tremor and you know, sine waves and things to measure. Um, so it, it may be there's, there's a lot there, and if, if you're struggling to, to find that, then you know, the other place I'd look is um, you know, clinical researchers who are involved in you know, uh, biometrics and that type of thing to, to, to sort of help. Um, identify some of those those sources but very often you'll find even in a rare disease you know if there's any sort of pharmaceutical biotech involvement they will have had to build a similar case as to why their pharmaceutical products might have an impact one day so it's, it's about understanding the, the condition holistically. Ellen, Paul, if I might ask you to hold that thought we're going to pick this up in the next episode of The Evidence Space. On this episode of The Evidence Space We've discussed how to involve patients at the centre of the healthcare technology design process. Devices which are intended to be used by patients themselves have got to consider the requirements of patients from the outset. We've also heard how data that is collected directly from patients can offer new insights which aren't available from the kind of data traditionally collected in hospital settings. This new data can actually go on and form the basis of novel technologies which don't already exist today. Please join us on the next episode of The Evidence Space, where we'll continue the conversation with Ellen and Paul. We're going to talk about how COVID has impacted the ability of patients and engineers to collaborate, and also the kind of considerations that go into deciding whether you're going to build your patient-centric device around an off-the-shelf consumer device, or whether it makes sense to build something much more bespoke. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes of The Evidence Space, 
please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.